Welcome to the Future of Sharing, the series where we're looking hard at how can we make the sharing economy work for everyone in the long term as well. I'm Pete Leiden, I'm the founder of reInvent, and we're here with Nikki Silvestri, who is uh, the founder and CEO of Soil and Shadow, which is a project management firm in the sustainability space. But she's also been in the sustainability space and, um, and kind of equity space for quite a long time, executive mm -hmm. director of People's Grocery and Green for All. Uh, and she is here to talk to us about uh, her thinking on sustainability issues, equity issues, but also we're going to apply it a little bit to our focus on the sharing economy. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Yeah, it's great to be here. So, so tell us a little bit about just what you're up to right now um, and a little bit of your background. And then uh, I'm kind of want to just think about your how you think about these issues and then we'll kind of get to the sharing economy applications a little bit later but tell us a little bit what, what you're doing with this new firm yeah so uh this firm is kind of a dream of my heart that has been a slow rolling thing over the last decade um and so soil and shadow is what it's called and i love that name because i feel like it actually gets to what I feel it is that I actually do. Hmm. So soil for me is the intersection between climate change and food systems, which hmm. is what I've been doing for the last decade in sustainability. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm a little bit of a nerd when it comes to the carbon cycle, because I did a lot of work in reducing carbon emissions, mm -hmm. but carbon sequestration and carbon drawdown was mm -hmm. also very important to me. And mm -hmm. then at the end of the day, it's really just rebalancing the carbon cycle. Mm -hmm. Carbon's not bad, it's just in the wrong places right now for humans to thrive. Mm -hmm. And most of the flora and fauna on the planet, but that's <laughs> another story. Um, and there are ways to reduce carbon emissions while also attending to the carbon that's currently in the atmosphere that doesn't need to be there in a way that makes everything else better. Hmm. And that's soil. If you put more carbon back into the soil, our food is more nutrient dense. There's better water storage and capture, which means that we don't get this crazy drought followed by the crazy floods that just disturbs mm -hmm. all of agriculture in the mm -hmm. state of California. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm also a microbe nerd at this point. So me and soil are, you know, really tight. Sounds like it. Um, so my firm does projects that are more on the healthy soil advocacy side. Mm -hmm. And there's not many of us, mm -hmm. you know, especially not many of us who have a background in social equity the way that I do. Mm -hmm. So we look at how to funnel more investment into healthy soil projects. Mm -hmm. We look at how to support practitioners. And we really look at what the theoretical framework for how mm -hmm. to view soil as a big picture solution is. <laughs> So that's the soil side of what mm -hmm. I do. And shadow mm. really refers to the people to people side mm. of what I do because working in social equity for so long, I really felt that there were so many good initiatives all mm -hmm. over the place mm -hmm. and really good ideas, mm -hmm. but it was people who didn't know how to play well together in groups mm. that tended to break things. Mm. It wasn't that the initiative was faulty. Mm. Um, that's and, interesting. Yeah, and just also, we, you know, humans control and domination. We have this thing inside of us that wants to control and dominate, hmm. and we treat each other like that. We treat the planet like that. It's it's a worldview thing, and if we don't address that, in my mind, policy solutions and systemic solutions that we come up with to rebalance our ecology and rebalance our economy are going to be reflective of that internal glitch that we have mm -hmm. around control mm -hmm. and domination. So so shadows, so say more to the point exactly. When you What's in the shadows of humans? Ah. How does that impact our ability to have harmony within and harmony in our external surroundings, oh, our relationship with both the planet and each other? So huh. that's kind of where social equity and environmentalism and economic development really converge for me, is okay. looking at us as humans and how we relate to one another and how we relate to the environment. So a good 50% of our portfolio also focuses on that pretty directly. That's so interesting. And then your background, give us a little, I gave you a brief introduction here, but tell us a little bit about your background that got you to that place. Like, yeah. What, what? So um, kind of starting from the beginning, I was very interested in black theater for mm -hmm. a long time. Mm -hmm. I come from this entertainment streak in my family. Mm -hmm. And was just convinced that that was what I was going to be doing. And then I was an Inconvenient Truth kid because it came out when I was in college mm -hmm. and um, learned about sustainability mm. as well when I was in college. Mm. And sustainability really impacted me because it felt so different than environmentalism. Mm -hmm. It was broader. It actually seemed to encompass everything mm. and be more holistic and was also very forward thinking. 
Whereas environmentalism to you felt just too focused on it felt very nature specific. Yeah, I see. Yeah. You know, and mm -hmm. not not relatable to me. Mm -hmm. Because I, I mean, I am an urban girl. Mm -hmm. You know, I grew up in the center of Los Angeles. I wear heels mm -hmm. to the grocery store. Mm -hmm. That's who I am. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. oceans and it was just, it felt very abstract <laughs> <laughs> to me. Um, and sustainability didn't because I learned about it as sustainable development, you know, mm -hmm. like the original definition of it. Mm -hmm. um, so in college, I was a student activist around it. And then when I graduated, most of the jobs that I took, on, well, I also got a master's degree focusing on political science and environmental justice and liberation ecology. And after that, I really wanted to build something. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know what was proactive in sustainability that had to do with low-income communities and underrepresented communities. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so that was, you know, green for all. I was actually at twice. I went there when it first opened um, in 2009, roundabouts, and was working on green jobs then. But food was really my heart and my passion. So then I did a short stint in New York at Slow Food USA, became the executive director of People's Grocery, went back to Green For All as the executive director, and then really needed to address this ping-ponging thing I was doing between food systems and climate change, never really mm -hmm. being one foot in. I was mm -hmm. always kind of one mm -hmm. foot in, one foot out, mm -hmm. never able mm -hmm. to decide. And that was when I really became a soil evangelist because it felt like it was this perfect intersection between the two. And Green For All, for those who don't understand that, um, Van Jones, that was, yeah. you, tell a little, a little bit, bit about, about Green about For All because sure. so, it's actually interesting. So Green for All was founded in 2000, between 2007 and 2008, and the mission statement is to build a green economy strong enough to lift people out of poverty, and it was founded by Van Jones. Mm -hmm. And um, the idea behind that really is that investment in the green economy means that there's going to be more jobs, a lot more infrastructure being redone, a lot of it is off the shelf. Of course, solar and wind are beautiful and sexy and all of that. Mm -hmm. And our buildings are super leaky and you could just take a mm -hmm. cop gun and redo a lot of this stuff mm -hmm. and it's off the shelf technology, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, so if we were really serious about building a green economy and being a closed loop society, there's a lot of work in that. So Green for All is an advocate for that. Mm -hmm. um, on, in, when it comes to policy, when it comes to movement building, when it comes to communications and media. It's mm -hmm. a pretty brilliant organization. Mm -hmm. So, and so now your latest thing is your own company that's essentially building off all that experience and kind of working on projects that either does one or the other or potentially both. Is that? Yeah, kind of that's right. Thing? And I mean, I can't really talk about Green for All without talking about People's Grocery because okay. I was the executive director there much longer. and. While Green for All was a national advocacy organization, People's Grocery is a local organization working on economic development and public health, but really through the view of food systems. Mm -hmm. So that was where I really got my hands dirty when it comes to local economic development and what it takes to build things on the ground in disadvantaged communities in real time in a non-abstract way. So say Super more about what you're doing there. So was that like bringing farmers market organic stuff to this different areas, or would you tell me what you meant by by the food? Yeah. Kind of so People's Grocery is located in West Oakland, mm -hmm. and the premise is that there's about thirty thousand people that live in West Oakland and fifty something odd liquor stores, but no full service grocery store. Mm -hmm. So hence the idea of People's Grocery, right? Mm -hmm. But it takes a long time to do food retail, especially at the full service grocery size scale because food retail tends to be pretty low margin. So People's Grocery, as a nonprofit, decided to do local small enterprise with the community that would be patching their food, their food sources so that in between times, before there was a grocery store, people could get access to fresh and healthy food. Hmm. So that organization was founded in 2003, and over the course of those years, there was the mobile market, which was one of the first of its kind in the country, rolling around the neighborhood selling fresh fruits and vegetables, um, there was a full, there was a full three acre farm hmm. that was there before my tenure. Hmm. During my tenure, we had a produce box service that hmm. was one of the first of its kind in the city to take food stamps, which was really cool. Hmm. And um, a partnership with the public hospital in their childhood obesity clinic, mm -hmm. looking at food prescriptions for children that were obese. We had several gardens around the city. Um, uh, business incubation program for residents in West Oakland. So it really looked at how to do economic development mm 
mm-hmm. both supporting entrepreneurs in the community mm-hmm. and doing small business projects around food systems that actually really serve the people mm-hmm. and how to have a public health angle on healthy food, whether mm-hmm. it was through gardens in the city or through partnerships with the public hospital in the city. Okay, so let's pull back a little bit on your worldview a little bit on um, sustainability. So, so you talked about the roots of coming onto that idea, but you have a very holistic or systems kind of thinking on mm-hmm. sustainability. Could you talk a little bit more about that and how that actually includes the kind of social equity issues as well as the kind of purely environmental kind of issues as well? In the definition of sustainability? Yeah, yeah, or just how you think about how to make things sustainable. Yeah, um, that actually, it feels like an interesting question to me because the way I learned the definition of sustainability Mm -hmm. was that it was ecology, economy, and equity together. Mm. That it was a three-pronged definition and Mm -hmm. that you couldn't, taking one of those three pieces means that it's not sustainability that you're talking about. Or that it wouldn't be, that a system wouldn't be sustainable without all three of them. Exactly. Okay. And I feel actually very privileged that I had a chance to learn about sustainability through that lens where you can't detangle the three Hmm. because there were very clear consequences to taking one of those three out of the equation, right? Just looking at ecology and economy together without equity means that you're doing a lot of the green stuff that's happening right now that doesn't actually look at social issues. Mm -hmm. If you just look at social issues plus ecology but you're ignoring the economy, then you're not having solutions that can scale enough to actually impact our economy. And Mm -hmm. if you're just looking at economy and equity, the way a lot of activists do, social justice activists, then you're ignoring the environmental devastation. So Mm -hmm. there's representations of two of the three all over the place. Totally. And sustainability is so unique because it actually makes sure that all three of them are together at the same time. But people who talk sustainability, do you think that's a prevalent point of view or you're saying that's a minority view at some level. There's a three-pronged way of thinking about sustainability. That's an interesting question. <laughs> well, you, 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 I mean, there's maybe no correct answer. No, I'm just curious. No, um, if you see your I'm point feeling, of view is consistent yeah. with a lot of people, or you think it's different? I'm feeling a little hesitant to answer, which is kind of interesting. Hmm. Um, I think when I meet people who are doing international work around sustainability, they're very rarely detangled. Um, mostly because it comes from that original definition of sustainable development, right? Which mm-hmm. was at the conference in Rio, I believe, mm-hmm. in 1988. So it was grounded in an understanding that we're looking at global development and that to bridge first world and third world countries, you need such a comprehensive view. Mm-hmm. And development, when it comes to a global international point of view, is not negotiable, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Um, However, in a Western point of view, mm-hmm. where we're already very comfortable and very developed, sustainability can take on a sheen mm-hmm. that's more a cultural thing than an actual development strategy. Mm-hmm. And I mm-hmm. think that's the separation that happens. So it is important to, it's been important for me to understand who I'm talking to and whether they're saying it as the cultural phenomenon mm-hmm. of sustainability mm-hmm. or the development version mm-hmm. of sustainability. Mm-hmm. We just, as an aside here, we, we did an um, event for reinvented, a, a physical event a couple months ago with Paul Hawken on yeah. his Drawdown yeah. book, and which he clearly interweaves all three. Absolutely. I'm on about. the advisory board. Oh, so, yeah, okay, okay, yeah. that's interesting. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. Well, so, for, so talk a little bit about that. So, so that's, that's a sense of, because um, you were talking about the carbon yeah. He's talking draw down. I mean, yes. are, do you share, and maybe we should explain this a little bit, but do you share the view that actually carbon is a fungible thing that we could actually draw down and not just slow down how it builds up and that there's actually a, a through line here to actually keeping the, clim- the climate under the temperature rise that could be quite disastrous, the 2% rise, or the 2 degree rise? I mean, he's, he's actually saying there is time actually to pull down enough carbon to avoid uh-huh. the worst consequences if we really right. do. I, I, have, you t- have you tuned into his, his, his ideas on that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't want to get into too much of a... No, but, no, but it's no, just, it's I'm good. just curious it's if good. you... Because I do see that very clear. Uh, he laid it out, so I'm just curious how you map onto that. Paul is brilliant, and I actually think we agree 100%. Um, and one of the things he had to do was not over-explain 
You know, he had to he had to boil down the idea of this piece of the carbon cycle to a simple enough idea that mm -hmm. it could be taken in by the mainstream. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's what I think Project Drawdown really represents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the concept and the idea that you can draw down enough carbon to avoid this, the, the rise that we're mm -hmm, looking mm -hmm, at mm -hmm. is a bit simplistic. Mm -hmm. um, mostly because then, you know, that tells everybody who's got all these fossil fuel stocks that we're saying you need to not ever burn, mm -hmm, ever, mm -hmm. and figure out a different way to convert them. Mm -hmm. They're like, well, great, if we're drawing down carbon, we can just burn, burn, oh, burn, I burn, burn. Um, which is why I like to talk about carbon as a cycle, mm -hmm, right? It's a carbon mm -hmm. cycle. If you take mm -hmm. some from here, more is going to come there from somewhere else. It's, mm -hmm. a, you know, it just, it's not static. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a ton of carbon we're not actually looking at or really documenting. Like the amount of carbon that's come out of the soil, for example, mm -hmm. through poor agricultural practices, mm -hmm. we don't really document that deeply. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We don't look at the fact that once we do start drawing carbon out of the atmosphere, the carbon that's acidifying the ocean right now is gonna start coming out of the ocean mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and putting more carbon into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. There's all these really complicated things mm -hmm. about the carbon cycle, which mm -hmm. is why it has to be attended to as one whole cycle. Mm -hmm. You can't just look at a piece of it and say, if I reduce emissions, it's mm -hmm. gonna be solved or if I draw carbon out of the atmosphere, mm -hmm. it's gonna be solved. You actually mm -hmm. have to have a systemic view of carbon mm -hmm. and understand, okay, so once we draw carbon out of the atmosphere, the ocean's gonna start off-gassing, mm -hmm. which means we need to increase sustainable agriculture all over the world to continue drawing the carbon out of the atmosphere so that the ocean can off-gas, in addition to making sure the fossil fuels never get burned. It's this multi-pronged strategy, which is also why Project Drawdown as mm -hmm. a book is mm -hmm. so brilliant, mm -hmm. because it outlines the 100 and something odd ways mm -hmm. that we're gonna continually be mm -hmm. in this dynamic relationship with the carbon mm -hmm. cycle mm -hmm. in a way mm -hmm. that it really needs to be. Okay, so we're definitely getting your systems view of how everything's interconnected. So let, let's shift a little bit to some thoughts on the sharing economy. Um, you said when we were talking earlier, you said um, when you're green for all, mm -hmm. the sharing economy was just starting up, kind of generally people started talking around 2008, 2009, it started picking up kind of around the crash and a right. lot of the Great Recession issues. Um, so just talk to me a little bit about how you started to think about the sharing economy and, and the themes you're interested in, particularly around sustainability and, and equity issues. Um, yeah. How are you seeing it then and how is, how, is it evolved in any way? I'm just kind of curious on your perspective on is the sharing economy potentially part of the solution of reusing things Indeed. Assets more, or, or, or just, I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on the sharing economy aspect of this. So just to locate us in time, I started looking into the sharing economy in 2014, because that was when okay, I was okay, back okay, as okay, the okay, executive okay. director of Green okay, for All. Okay, okay. And um, really the idea was that if the mission of Green for All is to build a green economy strong enough to lift people out of poverty, could the sharing economy be a part of that green economy? if it was focused on reusing current assets and making sure that current assets could be used by more than one person and really used for all they could be and give income then to the people that owned them, could that be something that could be very useful? Especially for you know, disadvantaged and underrepresented communities that maybe didn't own a lot to begin with who could get access to things that they may not have ever been able to own before. So it was an idea that I was exploring and the sharing economy, gig economy, whatever we decide to call it, is a very complex place. And I like to back up a bit from mm -hmm. talking about what it is and more so talk about the space that it filled. Mm -hmm. Because something needs to share that, needs to fill that space. That space and right now it's the sharing economy. So the space is that people want more freedom. Regular nine to five jobs are going out of vogue just culturally, especially with younger people. And there are still a ton of people in this country that are living paycheck to paycheck if they even have a job and or are in survival mode and need to be able and have always kind of hustled and patched together different things. So a lot of the ideas in the sharing economy, for example, were already happening mm -hmm. in low income mm -hmm. communities. They were just in the gray economy and mm -hmm. under the radar. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite ones is like, you know, the guy that would roll around the hood in his van picking people up and you'd text him, can I get a ride for $10, you know, to the store? 
because I don't have a car. Mm -hmm. And he would just be getting text messages all day, picking people up for $10. And that's how he would pay his rent and pay for gas and pay for food and all of that. Mm -hmm. And that was Uber, you know? But Mm -hmm. like most places in the hood that I grew up had that dude. Um, And I feel like there's other correlates Hmm. kind of like that. Or rent parties. (laughs) You know, like... I need to pay my rent. Come on over on a Friday night. I'm going to buy the alcohol from somewhere cheap, but you're going to pay 10 to $15 to come Um. over and dance at my house, you know? So I feel like there are, um, there are all those things that communities have always done to make ends meet. And the Mm -hmm. sharing economy tried to formalize those informal Mm -hmm. relationships. Mm -hmm. And whether it's useful, I think... That's actually the wrong question. I think the yeah. question for me is, what does the future of blue collar labor look like? Uh-huh. And that's actually, that's one of the projects that Soil and Shadow is working on right now. Is uh, We're about to release a paper called Designing the Future. And it looks at how the future of work huh. plus natural resource management and bridging cultural divides all fits together with regional economic development. <laughs> and I interviewed Natalie, actually Natalie mm. Foster for the paper. And um, it's some interesting stuff because the nature of work is changing. Automation is taking over. Mm -hmm. People still need protections, which is a huge thing in the sharing economy, Mm -hmm. is that if you take away workers' compensation and health care and all the rest of it, then what safety net do employees have? But Have workers have? Who aren't employees, you mean? Right, right. right. What what safety nets do workers have, Mm -hmm. not employees? but all of those questions have always existed. I think the sharing economy is just forcing the issue now in a way that it's needed to be forced for a long time. That's, really, that's an interesting insight. I like that. We, we, by the way, we are doing a whole other project on the future of, of work, actually, which is kind of picking up okay, on these, great. these exact. I'll and you, and you, and, and, yeah, I'd love to. It's just, it's like I made a note of that. It's like I need that. Is it coming out shortly? Yeah, like in the next two weeks. Oh, yeah. Two or three weeks. Awesome. I can send you an advanced copy of it to read. That'd be nice. Um, so, so anyhow, that's interesting. So, so just to kind of, so you're saying there's one, then this informal sharing-like economy at some level. Mm-hmm. It's through these technological ways of connecting smartphones over wireless networks that you didn't have 20 years ago, but you have right. now. Um, it's kind of... You used the word formalizing, but it's um, it's scale- it's making it scalable. Maybe mm-hmm. there's another way to think about it too. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are some promising aspects to that. But let, let's look at both sides of the things. What, what would be promising in in that arrangement that you see is is a good thing? And we'll think about some stuff that might be negative pieces about that too. The original hope, I think, and the original meme around the sharing economy is what's promising. That if I have a car. Like me, for example, you know, I I have, my husband and I each have a car, one of them's paid off. I work from home. The car that's paid off sits there. I don't leave the house more than three times a week, (laughs) you know, and that's just ludicrous. It's just this asset that's paid off that's sitting there that could be making me money. So that's promising, right? Um, Same thing with the house, you know, you buy this beautiful home, you have kids, we're about to have a kid, work all day. We're out of the house most of the day. I mean, I work from home, so that wouldn't apply as much. But even, you know, the trips that we take on the weekends, like just the fact that we have space that's Mm -hmm. not being utilized, Mm -hmm. that we could be making money on. Mm -hmm. I think the promise of the sharing economy was that it supported everyday folk who had assets that weren't using them all the time Mm -hmm. to be able to make money off of their assets and then allow someone else who didn't own those assets to be able to use them. So it was actually taking care of a market gap that is very real. Mm-hmm. And that is the promise. Um, well, this is, before yeah. we did the promise, because we'll, we'll get to maybe potential downsides here, but um, you had made this reference before about allowing people who didn't have access to these. So, so you're kind of talking about from the point of view of someone who owns it making more money. Mm-hmm. But then there's this idea that I'd like to just hear more from you. It's allowing someone who doesn't have those assets to at least, and couldn't necessarily own those assets, to use those assets or get access to those access. Maybe, yes. And particularly from the point of view of the equity issue. Could you give an example of that or, or some kind of make that a little bit more concrete about what you mean there? Yeah. Um, so if we're not talking in theory, if yeah. I'm talking about people I actually know, 
there's not as many examples I have of the access issue, and I more have examples of time, like time that could be used. So there's a, a gentleman that I know who has four kids, and um, he has a job during the day. And after the kids go to sleep, he doesn't have the kind of job where he can keep working because it's just it's a static job that happens when he's there. Mm -hmm. So he drives for Uber mm -hmm. in the after hours once mm -hmm. the kids go to bed. Mm -hmm. And on Friday and Saturday nights when things are really hot in Oakland and San Francisco, he can make a significant amount of money that mm. patches you know, the rest of the income he's able to make from his full-time mm -hmm. job with his family. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, two or three hours mm -hmm. over the course of that Friday and Saturday night. Mm -hmm. And then he can also drive during the weekday when he wants. Mm -hmm. And I feel like those are, for people who are hustling anyway, who may be patching together a few different jobs, mm -hmm. I don't even know if TaskRabbit is still a thing. Mm -hmm. it is. Yeah, okay, so for people who may have a bunch of time but don't have a car and are able to run errands, mm -hmm. dog walkers who are through that dog walking app mm -hmm. that I just saw, like, mm -hmm. time is the thing that I've seen people who are low income and in marginalized communities are able to leverage their time to be able to use these. And to make more income. And to make more income. But were you, and for you, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but like, um, I'll just give an example, and I'm not in that category necessarily, but for example, I couldn't afford a cabin you know, in California, a second house or something. But my wife and I just were able to use a little cabin for the Memorial Day weekend, right? Mm -hmm. That allow us to live that life for the weekend, you know? Yeah. I'm just wondering, but again, we're not in the category of, you know, um, but are there folks that are lower down the income ladder that are there examples of people that, wow, there it makes, it makes a vacation more affordable or it allows them to do things that they couldn't do if they had to save up and actually buy the thing rather than just use it temporarily. Does that make sense? It does. I think like I just... Like tools. I don't know. There's, there's people talk about they're sharing tools now in cities or they're sharing uh, all, all kinds of stuff. It's, it's just I'm wondering, have you, have you heard anything about that? I'm, maybe not, but I'm just thinking is, is there ways that expand Honestly, the possibilities for yeah, people? Yeah, I mean, there's kind of a cultural gap. Yeah, Frankly, that's just, that's just, yeah. there's the, there's a lot of theory about how people who don't own things can use the sharing economy, and just in my life, I haven't seen it. Seen it. That's interesting. Because okay. you know, tool lending libraries are not necessarily in the hood, hmm. you know, and um, even seed saving libraries. There's a few folks that I know because I'm in food systems mm -hmm. that are saving seeds and mm -hmm. sharing seeds, but mm -hmm. they haven't needed the kind of scale or technological infrastructure to do mm -hmm. what they've already been doing mm -hmm. better, mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to share mm -hmm. those seeds. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is a, I would be curious about where that is more than theory. Hmm. And if there's documented cases mm -hmm. of people, marginalized people and underrepresented communities actually using it that way. Hmm. Okay. Here's one though in the food space, and again, I'm just probing just because I'm yeah. interviewing all these people and things. Um, there have been examples of sharing economy food operations that are having one home make a big meal that then neighbors can come and tap into and get. So it's well, kind that's of, awesome. Yeah, it, it's, have you heard of any of these kind of food I things haven't. like that? Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Well, then we don't have to necessarily go there, but it was, we did a little video on this actually recently. Is, um, it's in Oakland there. But it was actually. I'd be curious about how that's different than underground dinners. Well, this may we, what's an underground dinner? They explain that a little bit? Where you cook a big meal at your house and then you invite your neighbors and friends over and they pay for a certain amount of money to eat at your house. It's very similar, although in this case, uh, they don't eat in the house necessarily. They actually make a big pot of food and they just bring the, a bowl or something and, or a sealable thing and then they actually go. But then they, they do pay. There's an exchange. Oh, interesting. And there's a way to actually collectivize the, uh, the making of food for busy parents and That's all that. Cool. But also it's healthy, good food. It's also lower cost because you're just making a giant pot rather than yeah. a few things. Anyhow, there's, it, it's, That's it's, cool. Well, I, should, well, I should connect with these folks. Um, yeah. the, what they're running into in terms of the sharing economy is um, food and health regulations. Of course. Because in their, as they scale, they're like... Right, of course. Well, what about the public safety thing? And yes. Is that a clean kitchen? And right. How, anyhow, so, so, which, is, which I guess moves into the next phase of this conversation I just wanted to th think about. So we talked about some positive aspects of this. Are there things that worry you or concern you about the sharing economy as it's evolving now and, and things that you'd say 
are problematic or potentially problematic. Well, what's problematic, I think, are the big picture things that everybody talks about mm -hmm. because of protections for workers and what does that actually mean and what's the difference between someone who's an independent contractor and someone who's an employee and mm -hmm. um, competition with taxi industries, for example, and Uber. So I feel like there's that world of it. Mm -hmm. And the world that I'm more connected to mm -hmm. is form and function, I guess. Like, what Same is it more. for and who is it for? Uh, and I think the more exposure that I've had to the gig economy and to the sharing economy, it's for folks that were not super on the edge anyway, folks that maybe were lower middle class who are trying to get to middle middle or upper middle class, mm -hmm. who have time, who have assets, who don't have a ton of debt, um, who are just not in survival mode, who hmm. are able to then get access to existing infrastructure because they have a bank account. They may have a car. Um, mm -hmm. They have stable housing, you know, like mm -hmm. all of those things. Mm -hmm. And that for those people, the sharing economy works great. And that's who it's functionally designed for. Hmm. Um, which is why this conversation about equity is really interesting because mm -hmm. I've heard a lot of um, conversations about just how the sharing economy isn't really accessible to people who are in survival mode or folks who are on the edge, but mm -hmm. it wasn't designed to be, hmm. kind of the way that most of society is mm -hmm. not designed mm -hmm. to be. Mm -hmm. So if there's confusion about that, it would be great to clear that up. Hmm. Because if it was designed for people that were in survival mode, then it would take those things into account, right? Um, and just right now it doesn't. So a great example of that, yeah, right, is that, yeah. uh, there's a huge thing in low-income communities about how a couple of expired parking tickets can just cascade into your whole life unraveling. Because if you don't have an extra 60 bucks, which a lot of people don't, to pay for one parking ticket, then you might get another parking ticket. That goes to a warrant. Your license gets suspended. Um, or, then you, and you keep, you keep driving because you gotta go to work. You still don't have the money to pay. Money's racking up. You get pulled over by the cops because you're black or brown, and you will mm -hmm. get pulled over by the cops, even mm -hmm. if it's just for nothing. Mm -hmm. Getting pulled over means your car gets impounded because your license mm -hmm. has a warrant on it. Um, mm -hmm. Then you may end up in jail. It's just like, so it's this cascading thing, right? Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. your whole life can unravel from a couple of parking tickets. Mm -hmm. So that is not really conducive to the sharing economy. <laughs> Or even like those minimums that they have, if you sign up to be a Uber or a Lyft driver yeah. and you don't have a car and you want to use one of their cars, yeah. there's a certain minimum of money that you have to make. But then what happens if one of your kids goes to prison or um, your baby is up all night sick and you already work two different jobs yeah. or you just had an operation? It's just like... <sighs> Marginalized communities, it's back to back. It is just, you get hit every day with a new thing. Huh. And um, making sure that things are actually workable for you and that you're not just piling on something else that's going to create more debt for you and get you in another caught up situation is really important. Or, you know, what if you have a felony? I mean, it's just like, there's just so many things. That's interesting. You don't have a bank account because the government's always garnishing your wages because you didn't pay taxes because you needed to pay for your baby's diaper. It's just, you know, it's one of those That's things. That's really interesting. So just thinking about a solution on that, just more tolerance or more understanding of that kind of category of person that's in that struggle mode might be helpful and from a systemic point of view in terms of the sharing economy. Is that, is that follow like that, what I say? Because we're also trying to think about, well, okay, what are the issues, but what are the things that could make it work for everyone. We're, we're trying to think out like, well, how can we make a sharing economy that works for everyone? Why so, does it have to work for everyone? Well, it's just kind of, I guess, a goal of, of the thing of trying to figure out if it's going to be a system that's going to take an increasingly large portion of the economy or something. You kind of want to make it accessible I to anyone or workable right now? Or you don't think so? No, okay, well, say, say more yeah, about that. That's a you're talking now to the ecologist. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> In me. Um, and I hear stuff like making it work for everyone or making anything work for every anything. Mm -hmm. And the ecologist in me freaks out because that mm -hmm. sounds like make farming work for everything. Farming mm -hmm. doesn't work everywhere. 
So there are some mm. places that need ranching because geographically and climate wise, mm. growing plants doesn't work there in mm. an agricultural place, you know? Or maybe it's a forest. So no, don't farm because it's a forest. So I feel like um, mm. having economies that mimic ecology, I'm a big fan of biomimicry, a mm. huge fan. Um, and understanding that every region, every economy, every social system is different. Mm -hmm. what, are, what does that social system need? What are the characteristics of it? How do we meet that? Instead of trying to take this thing that works for these communities and try to make it work for everybody. Oh, that's interesting. That feels completely backward to me. And, you know, kind of an example, right? Yeah, when yeah, I yeah. think about low-income communities and communities of color, there's the formal economy and then there's the gray economy. Yeah. And depending on how on edge a community is, more of them will be in the gray economy mm -hmm. than in the formal economy. Right. And the gray economy is not the shadow economy. You know, like these are different categories. The shadow economy is like legit drugs and like things that are illegal. The gray economy yeah. is stuff like, this actually may be illegal. I don't know, there's so much in the gray economy, I'm not sure where it falls. Okay. But you know, like the liquor store owner that sells individual cigarettes out of a pack, right? Because a lot of times people, well, I'm not gonna say this on camera. There are many reasons <laughs> why people would wanna buy one cigarette um, okay. or, you know, one cigarello. Right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, that's part of the gray economy because it's not quite formal. He's not selling the pack. Mm -hmm. He's selling one cigarette. Yeah. And, or the guy. The guy who I used to get the rides from, mm -hmm. right? Give him ten dollars, and mm -hmm. he's maybe, he didn't have a license for that. Mm -hmm. um, but that's how families make it, mm -hmm. you know. And that's it's also community building. Like there, mm -hmm. there's just so many other things that make those things in the gray economy work. Mm -hmm. And so that I, are positive, the community right, building that are positive, that. that are not the shadow economy. And it's very important to me that we distinguish between the gray economy and the shadow economy because mm -hmm. the shadow economy, those are the things that destroy neighborhoods. Those are the, um, you know, the loan sharks and the drugs and selling prescription medication and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So not talking about that. We're talking about the things people do to make mm -hmm. things work mm -hmm. um, that are not unhealthy for their community. There, it's possible that there's a sharing economy interface with that. Mm. But starting from the perspective of I have a solution or I have a frame and I'm going to make the information that I gather from this community fit my existing frame hmm. is backward to me. Hmm. It, like you actually go understand a system first, let the system tell you what it needs to thrive hmm. and let that be what it is. You know, that's the way any ecological systems manager would work with. Hmm. In ecology, you know, if you go into a forest, like I got some sand <laughs> because I work with beaches. Let me find out about this forest and see how I can use my sand. <laughs> it's like, no, it's not gonna work. Oh, I like that friend. That's really, but it's actually, it's definitely. But now you gotta admit, though, there's some tension. I, I love this approach, and it is really a surprising approach that I hadn't really thought about. But um, so you're saying essentially, almost like anthropologists kind of study or understand or be part of that community, however you learn. But you learn how that system works, and then think, if appropriate, how would it integrate into. Yeah. A more technologically driven sharing economy. Or Absolutely. Something. Which is not, I mean, there are, I'm on the board of an organization called the Business Alliance of Local Living Economies, mm -hmm. and it looks at local economic development. Mm -hmm. I'm more regional. Le locals in their title, they're actually more regional too. Mm -hmm. um, but anyone who does regional economic development mm -hmm. knows that you can't just take something from one city and drop mm -hmm. it into another. Mm -hmm. You know, you actually have to look at what's happening in that city mm -hmm. and then figure out if said policy is going mm -hmm. to work. Mm -hmm. um, or looking at a region, you know, all together, getting mm -hmm. to know the region first and then looking mm -hmm. at economic development mm -hmm. solutions from a cadre of things mm -hmm. that may work in that one locale. So it's having a suite mm -hmm. of options, a suite of mm -hmm. things that work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for me, the sharing economy is a part of a suite of economic development solutions. Hmm. Now, one of the ways the sharing economy in terms of it working for everyone does need to apply are things like Airbnb while black, right? 
or uber well black mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. those things that were happening mm -hmm. those are places certainly the sharing economy needs to think about because discrimination is built into almost every part of our society mm -hmm. and so of course it's going to show up if you just have platforms that don't attend to curtailing those instincts above board from the very beginning mm -hmm. and you can course correct i actually think airbnb is doing a good job to try to course correct that um, so that's the way that I think social equity fits into the sharing economy as it currently exists. But not necessarily expanding into that gray economy without a deep understanding of what's going on there first. Exactly. Uh, start with a design mind. Insight. Um, start with the design mind and the system thinking. And the, exactly. And, and then the, see, and have the sharing economy be a suite of things. I love that. With yeah. traditional workforce development, soft skills training, like all of the things, and then see what's appropriate. So just let's go back to that little piece that you were talking about the, the straight ahead equity issues in the existing sharing economy. Mm -hmm. um, you you talk kind of shorthand there very quickly, but do you want to just elaborate a little bit more on, on how you think about that? And I'm also curious why you think Airbnb is doing a good job on that. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the, the issues if someone was listening and didn't really understand it? So you're saying, yeah. if I could be explicit, it's, it's about people who might be discriminated, uh, you know, because they're host, they're a visitor. Yes. Of a person of color or something that is rejected. I mean, it it's is, just, I'm uh, just trying to be explicit. It has happened to me oh, where okay, I say, have say tried happened. to get homes. My husband and I were going on a, a vacation. I won't say where. And uh, I had my profile, just with my profile picture. And I submitted my request to several different homes to see if they would be available. And all of them rejected me because their dates weren't right or like, they just, you know, they were now unavailable. And I'd used Airbnb a lot before, so I just assumed that that was weird, you know? And that, no, I didn't, no, I assumed they were telling the truth. Because <laughs> that's how I am. Um, my husband, who is white, but works in the social justice community, said, put me in the picture with you. And I said, I I don't, that, well, that's kind of weird and disingenuous because I'm the one staying there. And he's like, but we're a couple. We are going on vacation. Just put me in the picture. Resubmit. See if that helps. To the same exact place? I submitted to one. They were still unavailable, but I think they were on their P's and Q's. And every request after that, we got selected. And I was... Um, to the I, same? Were they the... the they weren't the, the same. Oh, the same. Okay, we okay. submitted to different. I submitted okay. to one that was the same and they still rejected us because they weren't available. So hopefully they were really unavailable. But it was the first time I really started thinking, hmm. did I get rejected because I'm black? Like it just hadn't, I, it hadn't hit me before with hmm. Airbnb. Um, hmm. And that's when I started reading about it and talking to other African Americans who had tried to use the platform. And it was way before the Airbnb while black thing came up. Hmm. Um, but it turned out it was actually pretty common. Hmm. And I also noticed that I gravitated more toward African American hosts just mm. kind of unconsciously, which is mm. interesting. I started looking at that, like how many hosts of color versus how many white hosts did I actually go after? And, and, what, were, and what were you, when you, you, you found that interesting, what was going on in your mind explicitly? I'm just trying yeah, to um, You didn't want to be rejected or something? I think so. Hmm. I think it was like I didn't even want to go, I didn't want to have to over explain myself if I have natural hair. Mm -hmm. And I'm wearing hoop earrings in my picture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to have to go into the whole, mm -hmm. I have a master's degree, I am a professional, mm -hmm. I own my own business, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, just the bigger problem was that the platform represented America. Hmm. You know, there's bias and there's prejudice in America. And it started showing up on the platform. The fact that it was surprising is what kind of surprised me. But when surprising I say, to them or to you? Me. To them. Okay, I see. I unconsciously gravitated toward hosts of color because I have been a black woman my whole life. You know, mm -hmm. so there are ways that I just I course I autocorrect and I course correct myself in mainstream society mm -hmm. so that I don't get hit all mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. um, but it seemed pretty shocking to a lot of people. Hmm. Which was just another indication to me that we don't understand systemic racism. But mm -hmm. when I say Airbnb is doing a good job, mm -hmm. um, they did this. They weren't, well, maybe they were embarrassed. I don't know. But they did the things that feel like they should have been common sense. Mm -hmm. 
in the platform after that started happening. Mm -hmm. And that was what I was impressed by, the way mm -hmm. they talked about it. Mm -hmm. You know, like obviously they should have had something in there where if you reject one request for X dates, you shouldn't be able to accept X requests from other dates. But you wouldn't think to do that if you weren't assuming that discrimination was going to be built into your platform. You know, like why would somebody reject mm -hmm. one request and then mm -hmm. accept another request? Mm -hmm. So they started doing things like that to just actually make the platform. Is that true? That, that I didn't even know that. Is that a feature yeah, now? That's a feature. That now. once you reject someone, boom, it shuts down that whole system. Well, it, it for, shuts for the, for down that weekend. That time. For, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Oh, that's good. So know. you can't just be looking at request after request and denying request after uh, request and only accepting. If you're a verified person, for yeah, example, yeah. you know, like you can't just be screening based on the way somebody looks. Interesting. That's and there's also that anti-discrimination policy that they're now very at the forefront yeah. about. Um, at the forefront in terms of other companies? Doing no, just like that? on their website oh, and in their language and in their user policy, they kind of repeatedly pushed their anti-discrimination policy. Mm -hmm. Once all this started happening, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's good. That's interesting to hear. Um, we have talked to other folks about that, and uh, including this Laura Murphy. Do you know Laura Murphy, mm -mm. former um, ACLOU person who was uh, actually hired by them to kind of rethink that whole policy with Eric Holder? Mm -hmm. And anyhow, you know, there's a whole thing going on there that they're trying to figure that out. Um, how about other parts of the sharing economy? You had made quick reference to Uber, but that's a similar issues in, in that part of the sharing economy? Is that what you're Yeah, just in the sense that uh, I think that was drivers started being turned down repeatedly when their picture would pop up if people didn't want people of color drivers. Hmm. Um, and that was actually, it wasn't just Uber while black, it was like while brown, while any shade darker than tan, basically. Hmm. Um, and so people were just rejecting ride after ride after ride after ride until they got the kind of person driving that they wanted to get. Hmm. And the same thing was happening to riders, where people weren't getting accepted for rides because no one would pick up their request. I have no idea what those platforms are doing to try to work on that, but. Mm -hmm. well, that's an interesting thing. Um, has that ever happened to you, just out of curiosity, since you talked personally about that? It hasn't happened that? to me. Oh, okay. Huh, okay, well then, um, Actually, oh. that's the issue, right? I've never been a driver, so I can't see when someone rejects me. But I have had rides expire before. Well, I'll say I need a ride, I'll see there's other drivers and nobody picks me up. That has happened to me before. I have no idea why though. And you wouldn't know why. Because it could be another Because the platform so, yeah, is not, uh, um, they wouldn't tell you why. But if huh. there's riders, I do know that Lyft has this automatic thing where if there's someone really, if someone's already accepted a ride for you and there's someone closer, they will automatically put you with the person that's closer. So they, Lyft does have some mechanisms inside of it where there's some automatic things happening where if you are driving, you say that you're taking rides, they don't let you not take certain rides. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's another way like Airbnb. I just don't know what larger measures they may or may not be taking. So, so one of the things, um, just to tie a lot of this together is um, public policies. Um, I mean, a lot of what you're talking about in your new firm and in sustainability or in kind of food issues and things does point towards a, um, you know, for want of a better word, you know, a different regulatory system or a different incentivized system or evolving the, the system that we all work with. Mm -hmm. um, do you do a lot of work in kind of public policy spaces or any, any work in that kind of no. way? No, you don't. <laughs> Not anymore. Oh, seriously. Okay, well, <laughs> is there a reason for that? Maybe how frustrating it might have been? Or uh, yes. Um, I think every once in a while we all need a break. And uh, I either directly or indirectly worked with public policy for the majority of my career. And that thing that I said in the beginning about how it's not the initiatives that don't work, it's people not knowing how to play well together in groups. Mm. Getting into politics and policy is the quickest way to see that. And at some point, I would just be in a group of people and within five minutes be so frustrated I couldn't stay when it comes to people talking at each other. And this person obviously having some personal issue with this person 
and this person feeling defensive because this person has a personal issue with this person. So this person is not going to agree with anything this person says. That's what I want to talk about. They're talking about whatever policy thing they're disagreeing on and they're not going to get anywhere and we're going to have three meetings and waste a bunch of time. Mm -hmm. And in the land of political favors and tit for tat and pork barreling and all that, and you know, pork barreling still does kind of happen at the city level, mm -hmm. it's, it's just a bunch of personal politics. So maybe, yes, I do still work on public policy. <laughs> I coach people to be better and to be able to compromise which helps them know how to govern. Mm -hmm. That's how I work on public policy. Mm -hmm. But trying to deal with the symptoms and not deal with the cause of why we have lost our ability mm -hmm. to govern mm -hmm. as a country, mm -hmm. I'm not down for that anymore. Mm -hmm. You can see I get very passionate about this. Yeah, I can this see is, it. <laughs> this yeah, is you, 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 you've been there. Yeah, yeah you've had some. Um, well, then what is your theory of change? I mean, do, do you think that we can, through nonprofits and through companies or through public citizens, root around that kind of world? It's kind of polarized and kind of um, paralyzed in many respects uh, through this, what you're referring to and the other things we've seen nationally. Or, or do you see that as a temporary thing that over time you'll get back into? I'm just curious, how do we change this system at the level that you're thinking about it, if not through um, at least one big lever through public policy? Do you see other routes to doing that? Politics follows culture. So culture, yes, is the way I see doing that. Say more about that. What do you mean by that? Um, culturally, 40 years ago, there were all these videos going around on YouTube, I think, of Ronald Reagan's debate back in the 80, election of 1980. Mm -hmm. um, and the difference between what he was saying and what the person he was running against was saying was actually not that different. Like, they were both sane, rational, they were cordial to each other. And I remember a lot of millennials looking at that like, is that what politics used to be? You know, like just literally in shock. Like we actually used to be civil. And I actually could have voted for the other side and not felt like a total dumbass about it. And there's a way that the culture of social media and the internet and claiming everything as a part of our identity construction has pushed politics into this place of trolling and identity construction versus compromise and governance. So in my mind, that's where I feel like culture needs to shift again, where mm. we need to actually, we need to understand what governance is again and mm. why it's separate from government and mm. how and why compromise is required for resource distribution mm -hmm. and how to consider other people's needs before our own how to ask questions first and be curious first before mm -hmm. starting with an opinion. Mm -hmm. There's just like kindergarten level stuff that's not happening at the level of our political sphere. And mm -hmm. that kindergarten level stuff I don't think can be taught at the political level. It has to be more embedded in culture hmm. so that the leadership development stuff that happens before someone even gets into politics mm -hmm. and starts to govern is thick enough and is rich enough and is complex enough to actually build leaders. Mm -hmm. But we haven't built leaders for a long time, unfortunately. There's still, you know, there are leaders spread out here and there, mm -hmm. but a lot of folks are self-interested. It's kind of the same complaints that a lot of people have about politics, mm -hmm. but I feel like it's not unfixable. We just have to get to the core of the problem. Do you think, you made reference to millennials um, and, and implying, I don't know, that you're probably in that cohort. Ah! Uh, <laughs> I but, will say. Okay. There's that, um, I don't my mom ever... thinks that this is not true. Mom, <laughs> this is true, I'm saying it on camera. But there's that generation, we're not a generation, but there's that cadre of folk that were born between 1980 and 1985, mm -hmm. which is me, yeah. and um, that we are different, that we are the bridge between all the other millennials and Generation X, mm -hmm. because we, we're like 12, you know, I was like 12 or 13 when I got my first email address. Mm -hmm. I remember 56K. Mm -hmm. I remember DOS. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What? And the code you had to type in to get to the mm -hmm. word processor. Mm -hmm. um, I remember card catalogs. Like we're basically the last <laughs> analog group of people that 
got digital soon enough to feel like we're natives of it. Yeah. But our brains weren't hardwired around it. Yeah. And so um, well, that's interesting. I think I'm special in other words. I think you're special too. But I will say demographically you would be a millennial, front end millennial probably. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, but, you but, know, culturally, <laughs> Generation X. <laughs> I, I don't disrespect millennials. I, I have a proudly millennial. Okay. But here's what I'd say. The reason I'm tying this up and as we kind of wind down the interview, um, that culture change yeah. is usually so, it has to, it is more characteristic of generational change or some yes. fundamental changes. Mm -hmm. And what is true about our politics right now is it's still, it's only now that millennials are reaching the age where you kind of move into more active and political leadership. I mean, there's literally rules at some level for, uh, you know, how yeah. old, but also just takes experience and things to get to the point where you can really take political control. Mm -hmm. So are you hopeful that part of this culture change that you're talking about in politics is kind of alongside generational, demographic, all kinds of other changes might, uh, might help for that kind of system change and particularly in the sustainable direction you're, you're trying to think about? Yeah, that's interesting. I think governance and government are two separate things for a reason. Mm -hmm and that there's so much money in politics. Mm -hmm. Just what's happened over the last 15 years when it comes to how the business community interacts with politics mm -hmm. has means that business is a lot more powerful mm -hmm. than it used to be. Mm -hmm. And you talk about millennials like just not actually being old enough yet mm -hmm. to really get into things. Mm -hmm. If I'm- well, 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 to actually be running the country kind of level of and it depends leadership. on what you mean by running the yeah, country. Yeah, that's, that's true. That's true. Right? Fair if enough. I'm born between 80 and 85, and you look at who the new cadre of billionaires are, mm -hmm. and who owns these companies that are all the unicorns and whatnot, and how old they are, mm -hmm. or young they are, the money, and seeing as how there is money in politics, and seeing as how multinational mm -hmm. corporations are the ones that drive geopolitics in the world, I think that we're already actually very powerful mm -hmm. as millennials. And thank God we're the generation that has the best values. Um, so I think that the way people think about government mm -hmm. and its position and its power is going to change. Mm -hmm. I'm not a libertarian. I'm not mm -hmm. a small government kind of person. But mm -hmm. there's a way that there's a way to think about the function and the role of government and mm -hmm. what it's really meant to be doing and how that really, mm -hmm. how public and private sectors actually mm -hmm. interact in a way that's most functional mm -hmm. with that design mentality and mm -hmm. with that systems point of view mm -hmm. that I think millennials really have. And so... And we're already starting to remake it. Yeah, no, I, I, that's a convincing argument. I like that. Um, <clears throat> so are you hopeful about the future? I mean, a lot of people coming out of the sustainability or climate change space or... Am I hopeful? Or, 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 or not hopeful, but I'm, <laughs> but I'm curious. Are you hopeful? You seem hopeful. Honestly, yeah. I think it is an absolute coin toss as to whether or not humanity is going to survive. Hmm. And I did not always think that. That's really in the last five years. I've kind of been like, okay, there's a 50-50 shot, if that, that human homo sapiens as a consciousness experiment is mm -hmm. gonna make it. Mm -hmm. The planet will make it. It mm -hmm. may look like Venus, but it mm -hmm. will be fine. Mm -hmm. um, we may kill a bunch of, we are already killing a bunch of species. All of that feels very real to me, mm -hmm. but I think, I think my reflective practice, I mean, we're gonna go deep for just a second mm -hmm. here, but I, mm -hmm. I had something of a breakdown in 2014 after mm -hmm. I left Green For All. Mm -hmm. I think as a result of all this stuff, like, mm. I just, I couldn't hold it all anymore. And mm. I didn't know what hope looked like. Mm. And it got to me personally. It, like, burrowed mm. down deep inside me. And especially as a woman of color. Mm -hmm. You know, there, the compounding of people of color who know really what's going on with the environment. I don't know how we get up in the morning. Because mm. it's like, you hit racism every day. You know what's happening in the Arctic. You see the, the oceans and, like, no more coral reefs. And you're just like, we are fucked. Mm. Just plain and simple. And that's the place that I was at. Um, but I eventually, I started doing very deep reflective practice and I eventually got to this point where presence and connection hmm. is my hope. Hmm. So humanity may not be here in a couple hundred years, 
Mm-hmm. That the bearing that that has on me today is I'm going to love my husband harder, mm-hmm. and I'm going to be grateful that I'm embodied and alive in this moment. Mm-hmm. And even you know this choice to bring a child into the world, like my husband and I tried for four years. I decided four years ago I was going to bring a child into the world. This child decided not to come until this year. Mm-hmm. So they made a choice to come and embody in this, and they know a hell of a lot more about what's going to happen in the future than I do. Mm-hmm. So. I think I've just relaxed mm-hmm. a lot and I've learned how to be just very present mm-hmm. to what is mm-hmm. and even look backward at my ancestors that had to live through a lot more hardship than I did. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm the mm-hmm. product of 30 or something generations of rape, you know, mm-hmm. the breeding pairs that had to make it so that I could be here mm-hmm. had to be very strong and didn't know what they were birthing their children into or why they were birthing their children into chattel slavery. And they did it anyway, mm-hmm. because in that moment, you know, that moment of birth and looking into that child's mm-hmm. eyes, mm-hmm. I'm here with you. I'm present. There is love here. There is a reason to breathe. Mm. And I still think there's a reason to breathe. Mm. Wow. Well, that is a, probably a good place to end. And your do, when is your child going to be born? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Appropriate. Mm-hmm. So, wow, what an awesome conversation we just had with Nikki here. And... Uh, I tell you what, I learned a lot, a lot of things to think about. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.